Now, one additional way to achieve this is what we call our hybrid ablation. So this is, uh, again, at the end of the day, we end up with the same lesion sets as we do with this catheter alone procedure, but we get them there in a slightly different way. For a hybrid ablation, I partner with our thoracic surgical colleagues, and you would start off in the operating room. What they do is they, under general anesthesia, they make a small little incision here just below the sternum or the breastbone. There's a, two other little stab wounds here that they use for laparoscopic tools, but essentially they get into the abdominal cavity and then they can get through the diaphragm, which separates the chest from the abdomen, and then into the pericardial space, or the sac that surrounds the heart. They have little fiber optics. They can see what they're doing through this cannula that goes through here. The cannula is about, you know, about three-quarters of an inch around. And they can dissect down in there, and they can see into the, into the space behind the heart. And they can actually see the pulmonary veins where they enter into the back wall of the heart. And then they have uh, an ablation catheter that they use. Now, it's a different type of ablation catheter, and it lays down a lesion that's about three centimeters long, a little bit longer than an inch. And it's got some little coils on it, and the thing is shrouded. So the back, the back and the sides of it are covered, and the ablation portion is uh, exposed only on one surface of this ablation catheter. And when they put it on the back wall of the heart. They can actually see the back wall of the heart. They put the catheter there, and they turn on some suction, which basically sucks the thing onto the back wall of the heart, just like a suction cup. So it's very well adherent to the back wall. Then they can turn on the energy to this ablation coil, which they leave on for about 60 to 90 seconds. When they release the suction and take the catheter off, you can see this line that they've ablated. Now, the benefit of this is that the lesion sets that they put in are very robust. And when they overlap these dashes, as opposed to my dots, there's much less chance of a gap forming along the lesion. Um, so they can reach about 80% of where they have to ablate from this approach. But there are a couple areas due to anatomy that they can't actually get to. So, they get about 80% of the lesions put in through this scope that goes directly in. And then the patient comes over to the EP lab while still under general anesthesia. I put my catheters up, get over to the left atrium, and I just have a small little arcs that I have to finish up that they couldn't reach and verify that we have entrance and exit block from all of the pulmonary veins, make sure the roof line is intact, and we're done. The total procedure time is about the same between the two options. Um, it's just a matter of how we get the lesions in there. You're under general anesthesia for both procedures. There are some theoretical advantages to the hybrid approach, both in terms of safety and efficacy. So for example, in terms of safety, uh, because the ablation catheter is being applied from the bottom up against the back wall of the heart and the esophagus is down here and the ablation catheter is shrouded, the ablation lesions are directed away from the esophagus and there's this uh, less risk of injuring the esophagus with thermal energy. As well, when they finish the hybrid ablation, they leave a drain in the pericardial space that comes out through the abdominal wall. That drain is going to be removed usually the following morning. But basically, if while I'm doing my procedure, I end up with a perforation, you already have a drain in there. So the safety factor is more favorable in terms of complications, both avoiding injury to the esophagus and having the pericardial space around the heart already have a drain in it. As well, it may be better in terms of efficacy. So there's less chance for gaps in the lesion set that encircle the pulmonary veins. So the initial data would support that this has, again, about a 10% better efficacy in terms of preventing recurrent AFib than a catheter alone procedure. Now, the compromise is, of course, that you end up with this nifty souvenir incision here, uh, courtesy of the thoracic surgeons, which is small. It's about that long, but still it's an incision. 
people will usually stay two days in the hospital following a hybrid AFib ablation, whereas I'm usually sending them home the morning following the procedure with a catheter alone ablation. There are some additional reasons why we might favor one approach versus another in terms of how we do an ablation. Folks that have very normal size left atrium, paroxysmal AFib, meaning they go in it, they come out of it on a frequent basis, uh, they may be more amendable to catheter ablation. Folks that have much larger atriums or they've been in persistent atrial fibrillation where they've been in it for more than a week or only come out of it with a cardioversion, those folks may be better served with the hybrid ablation. So we would talk in more detail about which type of ablation is most appropriate for any given patient when we see them and take all of these variables into account. So um, following an ablation, we would typically um, have folks back to the office. They would, if they had the hybrid, they'd see the surgeon for follow-up of their incision, usually a week or so later. Um, I would plan to see them back within a couple weeks to a month afterwards to reassess how their symptoms are doing and then march out from there. If you're on antiarrhythmics coming into the procedure, uh, we may discontinue them briefly before the procedure or we may continue them for a month or two th after the procedure, but ultimately our goal would be to see if we could get you off those antiarrhythmic agents and just maintain normal rhythm long term. Now, another important issue to think about is anticoagulation. I mentioned that there is a risk of stroke from doing the procedure, but there's also a risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation itself. Um, not everybody has the same risk of stroke, but if we're doing an atrial fibrillation ablation, no matter what your long-term risk of stroke is, folks are going to be on a blood thinner for at least a month before and at least three months following an AFib ablation of whichever type we do. Otherwise, then, we look at folks in terms of what's your long-term risk of stroke. And there are a variety of risk factors we look for. There's major and minor risk factors. And these things are taken into account to decide how aggressive we should be at trying to lower your long-term risk of stroke. So, for example, the two major risk factors are if your age is over 75 or if you've had a prior stroke or mini-stroke, a TIA before. Those, each of those would put you into the higher risk group by themselves immediately. There are two pointers on the scale. The other ones are minor risk factors and they're one point each. That's if your age is over 65, if you're female, have a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure, or vascular disease. And that includes coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, or peripheral vascular disease. We total up the points. The more points you have, the higher your risk. If, you're o, if you have zero risk factors, your risk is truly very low, and nothing may need to be done to try to prevent strokes as a complication of AFib. If you have one risk factor, your risk is less than 1%, probably about 0.7 based on the studies, 0.7% a year of a stroke on no therapy. For those folks, usually it's either aspirin to reduce your risk of stroke or a blood thinner, an anticoagulant, of which we have now three different varieties. There's the tried and true old-fashioned warfarin, which has the advantage of being dirt cheap, um, but requires monitoring in terms of getting your blood drawn to check to see how thin your blood is so we can give you feedback on how much warfarin to take. Uh, there's a therapeutic window that we need to keep you in. We want your blood thin enough to get the benefits of preventing stroke, but not too thin that there's no additional risk lowering for stroke, but your risk of bleeding starts to go up. So the only way to check where you are on that is to sample a blood test. That can either be by a tube of blood in the lab, or sometimes we can poke your finger and get a drop of blood and uh, assay it that way. But then we tell you how much Coumadin to take and when to get it rechecked again. The other two agents are newer. Um, they're easier from a patient perspective. Uh, but they're more expensive. One is called Pradoxa and the other is Zeralto. Pradoxa is twice a day, Zeralto is once a day. Um, these agents work through a different mechanism than warfarin, um, but they're equally effective. And uh, the benefits are that we don't have to monitor your blood. Um, it's one dose um, based on your kidney function, um, and that's it. Um, there's no interactions with foods. So whereas with warfarin, 
foods that have a lot of vitamin K dependent things, which is a talk of itself, uh, but they can interact with your Coumadin. There are several drugs that can interact with your Coumadin. Amiodarone, one of those antiarrhythmics, being one of the big ones. So we have to take those things into account when we're putting people on warfarin. Uh, the newer agents don't have any of these dietary interactions or, uh, to any significant degree, any other drug interactions, so they're much simpler. However, they're typically much more expensive. Uh, different insurance companies may or may not cover these agents. So long-term management of stroke risk in atrial fibrillation is something that we uh, individualize depending on a large number of different things. Uh, but those are the available options. Aspirin, nothing. Aspirin alone or one of these anticoagulants. Now, um, let's see. One very important idea to keep in mind in terms of managing AFib is that the management strategies are all directed at symptom control. So we're trying to improve your symptoms. There is no data to date that shows that getting you back in normal rhythm or trying to keep you in normal rhythm either with drugs or with one of these ablation procedures lowers your long-term risk of stroke nor is there any data that shows that doing this makes you live longer. What we do have good data about is that we, if you have symptoms from AFib to begin with, one of these approaches may work well and reduce your burden of symptoms. So symptom management is the primary reason to do this. And there are, we, we have done, the royal we meaning the medical community at large, has done studies looking at the efficacy of antiarrhythmic drugs in terms of mortality and stroke risk. And the surprising finding was that even when we think we're doing a good job with these medicines and people have no symptoms, their stroke rate doesn't go down. Um, they don't live any longer either. And there's some retrospective data looking at this that suggests maybe maintaining normal rhythm does make you live longer, but being on antiarrhythmic drugs is dangerous, and the two are equally offsetting. So the mortality is equivalent to a rate control strategy. That retrospective look at these trials with the hint at least, this isn't good science to do it this way, but at least the hint that maintaining normal rhythm may convey a mortality benefit was one of the big drivers that led to the development of the AFib ablation. Since if we could do a successful AFib ablation and keep people in normal rhythm without antiarrhythmic drugs, they may actually live longer. The study that's looking at whether that really pans out is ongoing, and it won't be, the data won't be available and we won't have our answer for another several years. It'll be big news when that trial finishes. It's called the Cabana trial, if you want to look it up, C-A-B-A-N-A. -A -A. Um, but for right now, in present day, doing an AFib ablation or putting you on drugs to maintain normal rhythm are entirely directed at managing symptoms related to AFib. And it will not change your long-term um, indications to be on blood thinners or not. That's an important idea that oftentimes people come in saying, I want an AFib ablation so I can get off warfarin. And that's not really going to work. 